So welcome to my talk and welcome to Security Village. Um, just a few words about me because I don't have a lot of time and I like to talk, so I'm going to talk a lot. So I'm Ben. You can, I'm co-founder of Armo, uh, maintainer of Cubescape, also contributor at Tech Security, and uh, I used to be a um, whitehead hacker for a really long time. And uh, yeah, I have a big family of four kids at home who are waiting for me. So um, usually, um, you know, most of the cyber talks you're hearing um, have this effect on people that they're hearing this, all these keywords like log4j, and I don't know, uh, solar winds, and and the people are like going out of the cyber token, like this, we are doomed. Now, I really hope that this is going to be a different cyber talk. So I'm going to share with you uh, uh, something we did at Armo, the way we leveraged uh, cloud native technologies in order to uh, create what we call continuous security. Uh, how much of you are using CI CD? Can I have hands up with Kubernetes? Yeah, so I think it's going to be relevant for you, like a good match here. So um, what we're going to talk today about three different uh, aspects of your security. These three different aspects, two of them are Kubernetes native policies. One of them is related to your vulnerability posture in your applications. Um, and we're going to talk about them, how you can leverage uh, your CI CD to make those things much better and, and like what we call decrease your blast radius uh, in your uh, systems. We are going to show, I'm going to show you that how we are um, generating runtime policies uh, from, uh, from ap actually from application behavior during testing and how we are adding it to the CI, our CI CD. And, you know, I'm going to talk about well, how is it, is it good, is it bad, or uh, I guess you know where I'm going with this, but it's going to be good, hopefully, for all of us. So, today's threat model is uh, like, um, very, I think, a very classical threat model around, uh, um, around the Kubernetes cluster. So, most of the times our pods uh, can be either accessed from the direction of the public internet, either by um, a service, a load balancer service or ingress. Uh, this is how they are getting traffic from the outside world, or maybe an attacker will try to penetrate uh, your pods through supply chain, through image registry and so on. Um, but what I'm going to tell first thing, what I'm going to show you is actually the application exploit, so your vulnerability posture in your workloads. I'm going to show you how you can decrease um, the noise around them and only focus on the real things that really matter on here. The second thing is that if the attacker was able to penetrate your workload and have a code execution in your workload, uh, in the confinement of your pod, then it has two, uh, the attacker has two directions to like uh, do lateral movement or progress. Either he can target your kernel trying to escape the confinement of, of, uh, of the containers which are making up the pod, and we are calling them kernel exploits. Uh, we had a, flow of, uh, a few of them, and as soon as, the, uh, if an attacker is able to escape in a Kubernetes node, escape the, the confinement of, of the pods, um, he or she will be able to most mostly will be able to take over your cluster because every Kubernetes node has its node secret. And if the attacker is able, which are most, in the most of the time, they are simply files on the, on the file system of the Kubernetes node. So if the attacker will be able to take over these files and these secrets, he will be able to talk as a Kubernetes node to, with the Kube API server, and it, he has a lot of uh, leverage there. The other way the attacker can progress from here is from a pod is actually doing lateral movement in the network, uh, going after other pods, going after unprotected uh, um, parts of the cl in a cluster, which should be internal. Uh, but when the attacker was able to enter the, one of the public facing pods, then he's going to be able to like uh, move in that direction. So this is our, our, our threat malware for today. I'm going to show you three things. One is how to reduce the noise around application potential application exploits. Second, if how to uh, uh, 
decrease the attack surface uh, for, for the node, uh, and how to uh, reduce the attack surface for lateral movement. And together, we are decreasing the blast radius of the, uh, of the attack itself. So the first thing is application vulnerabilities. So most of us using different kinds of security scanners in our systems in order to know what are the uh, vulnerabilities inside our software packages in the container images. So these tools are um, very good, good tools like Trivi, Gripe, Anchor, uh, Sneak, and so on. But there is a so small problem with that. Um, like in general, at least for our production system, we have public uh, open source images with more than 100, even 200 uh, vulnerabilities, which are really, really hard to handle. And, and for us as a sm relatively small company, it's really, really overwhelming. But even with the bigger company who has more resources, they will have obviously more microservices, more images. So this is not something that scales very well. Uh, so it is really hard to handle all these application vulnerabilities and always update them. So it's very, very costly to manage them. So the first thing we are going to use in our CI CD is uh, a new feature by Cubescape. Actually, uh, we are releasing it this week or maybe in the first uh, uh, days of, of, of next week, which is, uh, we call it the Cubescape relevancy. Uh, Cubescape is a CNCF project. Um, I'm one of the maintainers, as I said before. Uh, um, and what we do at Cubescape is we are installing an eBPF uh, agent inside uh, every node, and this agent reports to us back all the file activities on every workload which is run which are running inside the cluster. Now, we are getting a stream of files which are touched inside uh, the workload, this enables us to take the SBOM of the container image, which is running inside the workload, cross the information of which files been opened inside the workload with the list of files inside the SBOM, and mark all the uh, packages, software packages inside the SBOM, which has been really used and opened inside the container runtime. Now, this enables us to create, remove all the packages which haven't been touched uh, touched during the runtime of the container, and we can remove uh, all those which are not relevant, not really loaded, and feed back to the vulnerability scanner, and we'll get a, short, uh, a filtered vulnerability scan result list. Now, um, we're, I'm going to show you in a demo at, at the end of the uh, presentation, but I can tell you that in our production system, it lowered the number of vulnerabilities by 80%. Uh, which is a huge noise reduction for us. And, and I really, really suggest all of you who are working with vulnerability scanners uh, to look into this. So this is our first component. The second component is, uh, as I told you, is how to protect the kernel, how to remove the attack surface uh, on a Linux kernel inside the Kubernetes node. So in the pod security context, you have all these classical things of, of what's the user ID and group ID of the, of the container, uh, which either you can change or cannot change depending on the uh, container image. Obviously, the right thing is not to run your containers as root, uh, but sometimes the container image itself requires uh, uh, user ID zero, so it's, you have to recompile and change, and it's really hard sometimes. The other thing is uh, which you need to handle here is the capabilities, Linux kernel capabilities of the process inside the container. So, and remove all the, the things you don't need, or even if the container is a privileged container, check whether you really need it to be a privileged. But I have to tell you that since here the default is off nearly for everything, most of the applications are, are okay in, uh, from this perspective. The third thing, which was the thing which we are going to talk about, is actually SecCom policies. SecCom policies are there to uh, enable you to control that what, uh, the containers inside your pod, what kind of system calls they are allowed to make to the kernel. Now, the, th uh, the reason why we are talking about it, that I did a small research a half year ago, looked over all the CVs of the Linux kernel, which were showing uh, uh, container escape. And as it turned out, 
uh, uh, most of them were using system, uh, uh, the attack, uh, uh, they actually needed to use system calls, which were like very exotic system calls, uh, which are usually made by only uh, uh, applications which are managing the node. And your, we, our applications usually don't need that. So it is a very good way to protect our kernel by removing all the unneeded system calls. So in order to apply second profiles, either we are using pre-made profiles, pre-made list of system calls our application is allowed to do. Either it breaks the application or it allows the application or the application can run. But usually they are, uh, if, even if they are running, they are over permissive. You can, uh, other ways to uh, you do a manual definition of these uh, second profiles and create a list of system calls your workloads are allowed to do. But it is a very tedious job for every each workload. And honestly, we don't usually have the professionals to do this work because uh, if you are telling the application developer today that uh, uh, ask him what, is the, what are the system calls you're making, he won't understand what you're talking about. So, um, so the best thing we thought is to like generate from actual application behavior, check what are the system calls the application is doing, create the recording, and turn it into uh, a policy. Uh, Caitlin was talking about it yesterday. Uh, so there is the Kubernetes security profile operator. It's a Kubernetes uh, uh, six security project, an awesome project which enables you to record using eBPF all the system calls uh, your application is making, create a recording, turn this recording into an actual policy object, and apply the policy. Again, what you have to take about, uh, from this slide is that you're using an, a pre-made tool to generate the list of system calls uh, you, your application is doing, and you can use it also to turn into an actual profile object and enfor have Kubernetes enforce it. Network policies, on the other hand, I think the least uh, complex thing to explain here in the security village. I think everyone knows why network security is important and why locking down a different network, uh, unneeded network paths in, in an application environment is very uh, important. There are reasons, you know, to uh, uh, the attacker will need, uh, uh, can do if there is no log, uh, no micro segmentation in the, ne uh, in the network. Uh, of a Kubernetes cluster, you can, the attacker can do reconnaissance, lateral movement, and can ex uh, exfiltrate data uh, from, pod, from other pods through uh, unprotected uh, uh, APIs. So the problem, major problem with, with network policies in, uh, in um, not just cloud native, but in general in cloud environments, uh, as opposed to uh, like old style monolithic uh, um, self-hosted environments, is that the application, we have microservice infrastructure uh, architecture with multiple components and and it's really hard for to know what who needs to talk to whom and if you're investing time in it and you're defining it once you're working really really hard but at the end of the day uh, uh, you're applying it and you're might be bro breaking some of the application features then you have to go back iterate it uh, talk to the application uh, developer and so on uh, back and forth and you're created your application uh, your network policy but at the end what uh, what it turns out that that the application within two weeks changes again and it's like again broke because it uses a new network path which wasn't used before so it's very very hard also to maintain because uh, because it is spread around among multiple uh, functions in the organization and there are a lot of things to to break so here we also decided to go uh, after an automated tool uh, inspector gadget another cncf project uh, i think it's got to sandboxing in two in, in a month or two, uh, two months before it's a great project again same thing using ebpf to detect who's talking to whom inside the kubernetes cluster um, the inspector, you can run the inspector gadget as a record mode. It will create you the list of who's talking to whom, and then you can turn it into a network policy object in Kubernetes and apply the network policy, which is actually the network policy object will reflect the actual connections uh, it saw before. So think about the following. Um, had we have a magic box where we are throwing our application with all of its workloads, uh, inside the box and everything it needs, everything it runs, and, and also uh, out of the box comes uh, uh, a short list of vulnerabilities your application has, you really have to concentrate on, uh, network policies and security and uh, second policies. So it would, it would be really great. And why it is really, really great? Because this is what we good to uh, here. 
We are really good at automating things, like, right? We really love it. If you have to work manually, you know, we'll break things always, we'll have all, all of these problems. If we can automate all these, uh, uh, these processes, we can earn a lot uh, with this because we can have automated security. So it will make our, our uh, security people, our DevOps people, and DevSecOps people very, very happy. You are seeing, by the way, all of the images here, uh, I've generated them with uh, Midjourney, uh, so like it was a um, really nice thing to like play around uh, preparing this presentation. So they are smiling here, uh, slightly, by the way. Uh, so um, this brought us really to the concept of, of if we have CI and CD, we should have continuous security, right? Because it's a really good uh, approach to trying to hook up all these things in our existing processes in our CICD, we're already running tests. We are already like uh, 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 doing this, a uh, lot of things of testing out application behavior. If we could capture all this information during the testing phase, we could actually turn these behaviors into, uh, into policies and apply these pol uh, policies into our, uh, into our systems. So which would make, improve our security much better. So, let me go through the way, the simple way of how you know uh, we can we can do this. So the first thing is to like create a namespace where we are going through. We'll throw all of our components and we'll test them. We start recording all with all of these tools, either of those or just uh, uh, one of them, and we can deploy the application, run the tests on the application, stop the event recording uh, uh, when we finish the testing, generate policy objects. Now we are rebuilding the application with these policy objects, uh, applying them to the Kubernetes cluster, all of those, rerunning the test in order to make sure that we are not, haven't generated uh, um, policies which are actually breaking our application. And after we retested the application, we are committing these objects into our Git repository so they are picked up by Argo in the production. So uh, I don't know, is there here anyone who saw my teaser at Twitter? before coming here like i've promised a joke but actually about uh, uh, about uh, uh, inspector gadget the panda and captain cube uh, going into a, a, a coffee shop in amsterdam this is the by the way this is the picture mid journey generated from it uh, but i couldn't come up with a joke i mean I, i'm sorry uh, but I, I think it's cute or at least the people told me it's cute uh, so what I'm going to show you is I'm showing, going to show you a demo of all these three things we talked about. I'm going to do a small environment setup. Uh, we're going to see how the second profile is generated. Uh, we are going to test out and uh, prove that the second profiles are working and indeed protecting us. We are going to do some network policy generation. Uh, again, using the, uh, the testing phase, where we will test out the network policies. And at the end, we are, I'm going to also show you the vulnerability, uh, uh, reduction, uh, vulnerability reductions with, uh, I've told you before. So let's hope that the streaming is working. Okay, so, okay, so the first thing, uh, thing is uh, I'm creating a minikube. Uh, in our, I'm, by the way, at the end, you will see I, I'm publishing a GitHub repo uh, with all these things as goodies as an examples. So uh, I'm installing in, in the Minikube uh, um, the cert manager. Uh, I'm installing the Kubernetes security operator. I'm still in, uh, installing inspector gadget and Kubescape, all three things uh, inside uh, during the installation phase. By the way, I, I'm not sure that you have seen Minikube starting up so fast. I have to say, I have edited the video, so. Uh, uh, but now the first thing I'm doing is actually, you're, I'm running the test for creation of second profiles. So the third thing is I'm creating the recording objects for, uh, for recording all the applications I have in my namespace. I'm creating the applications, and then I'm waiting for all the deployments to start up. After the deployments have started up, I'm running tests for 60 seconds. We are not going to wait here for 60 seconds. I can, I've edited the video, uh, but believe me. Uh, and after, uh, sorry. So after it, I'm scaling down all the deployments, and after I, which triggers actually the generation of the second profiles, which are, you can see on the screen. After 
The second profile has been uh, uh, generated. Um, I'm reapplying uh, the second profiles, which have been created to all of the deployments automatically, and restarting the whole application. Uh, sorry. Um, you can see that we've created all these, during this phase, we've created all these YAML files with the profile objects themselves. I'm going to open here one just to show you what you have in these YAML files. These are the SecCom uh, um, profiles. So you can see here a list of, of, of different system calls the application is doing. As you can see, it's not really good to like generate this manually. Um, but it's really great to generate them automatically. So what, we're, what I'm doing is now is I'm trying to show you how it protects the cluster. So I'm going trying to open a shell on one of the pods, which is protected uh, with the second profile. Um, the thing, what you're going to see is that you don't see anything, which is kind of cool because I'm trying to open a shell here and the shell is not opened. It is not open because the shell itself uses system calls, which the application haven't used and therefore the shell is not allowed and, uh, and the, it is killed by the, the system. Now what I'm going to do here, just to show you that I'm not cheating, I'm removing the second profile for the, from the actual deployment here. Um, you can see at the security contacts of the pod, you can see here the second profile with the JSON file which contains all, uh, all the system calls. I'm deleting and then restarting the pod um, after the editing the deployment. And what you will see here, that I've removed this, uh, the uh, second profile, is that I will be able to actually open a shell. Mm -hmm. You can see here the second uh, uh, pod is the one who's been, the second version which has just been created. Um, I'm doing a shell, trying to open a shell using exec. And you can see that I was able to, without the second profile, was able to open a shell. Now again, uh, just for, uh, for like explaining uh, shortly, let me just stop it for a sec. So this, uh, uh, the way I've presented, I didn't try to do an actual attack on the Linux kernel. I just show it through uh, that the second profile works through the shell I tried to open. But think of it, most of the use you're getting uh, out of this is not just like protecting against processes which, which are shouldn't running inside your container, but you're protecting the, your kernel as well. So not, I'm showing the second process where I'm creating uh, network policies. Um, so I've enabled the recording uh, and restarted the hipster shop application. By the way, it's called, the application is called Google Microservices Application. Uh, which is a great demo app for these things. I'm again recording all the network events. After I recorded all the network events and run the application for a minute, I've generated a network policy file, which I'm going to show you here. For this, again, I'm used uh, um, inspector gadget. So I'm opening the network policy object and you can see these, uh, uh, these network rules that who, which pod is allowed to talk to which pod inside the, con uh, inside the cluster. Now I will show you that it, it's indeed it's working and protecting your cluster. So I will try to, as you remember, I said that the attacker would come from the first public facing pod. So in our case, it's the front end uh, workload. Uh, here I'm opening a shell in, on it, and I will try to access the Redis component inside this demo application, which is should be the database in this demo app, um, and would be like very logical for the attacker to to try to exploit. In general, they shouldn't be talking one to another. They should be like the front end should get information through other microservices from the Redis. Uh, in this case, I'm opening a shell and I'm trying to telnet into the Redis cart. Uh, um, Redis component to its port, um, and if it succeeds, then it will say that it's connected. If not, then it will won't say anything. And you can see that it, it's stuck because network policy is protecting actually this uh, this pipe. And and I'm going to delete afterwards the network policies just to show you that in general they are able to talk to one to another. 
And there is an interesting thing here because in Kubernetes network, native network policies, you have the ingress and egress part. So you're like you're protecting from both parties. Uh, in our case, I needed to delete both of the network policies, both for the Redis and both for the front end, because one of them is denying going out to the Redis, the other is denying accepting form from uh, 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 traffic from uh, the front end. So now I'm trying to, after I deleted the network policies, I'm trying to uh, connect the Redis card and I'm going to be, it's very surprising, but because you don't have network policy, you can connect and it's not good, obviously. And I forgot how to use Telnet properly. S sorry. Um, so, and now the third thing is the vulnerability scanning. So um, I've installed uh, Kubescape in the cluster and deployed the, again, the application and Kubescape is scanning the uh, image vulnerabilities in the background. And what I'm doing here is I'm, uh, after it scanned already continuously the vulnerabilities and it has all the information, and let me stop it for just a, a minute to explain you, uh, it generated two uh, vulnerability objects both of them are in SPDX format. Uh, one of them for the base image, not the base image, for the image itself. The second is based, uh, vulnerability list is based on the actual application behavior. So we can compare them one to another here. And you will see that in the case of this workload which I chose, which is called recommendation service, I will try to extract the number of, of vulnerabilities through the kubectl uh, to show you how many uh, critical vulnerabilities you have in this application, and you have seven. Now I'm trying to show you that you have high 74. Um, again, 50, uh, uh, 58 uh, medium vulnerabilities, which is kind of a lot. But now let's check when we overlay the information of the runtime from the EBPF, which I told you how many vulner actual vulnerabilities we get after the filtering, and you will see that it is much less which is actually kind of the point of this demo. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm trying to find how many critical vulnerabilities I have. Uh, only three of, out of seven are indeed in the memory. 19 out of the 74 of the high and 17 out of the 58. So there is, we have a huge number of vulnerability reduction here. And I can say that even this is very well maintained. These are very, very well maintained images. So we've seen images where we got like 90% out. So this was the demo. Uh, I hope you could follow because it was a lot of information, I'm sure for like in a short time. Okay, so this means that our, our DevOps is, is like really, really happy and also not just the DevOps, but security guy and, and also developers because they've saved a lot of time and now they have time for cakes and I don't know what the drink is, but it looks good. Um, so let's talk about what is wrong with this because, you know, um, it's nice to be for me coming up here and promoting an idea, but let's talk about what's wrong with the idea. So um, what we noticed actually in, uh, when we install this in our systems and uh, this process, we noticed that we, are, we have to allocate more, much more CPU for this EB, eBPF-based uh, um, um, tools uh, during the testing phase, and it, like, it costs some money. I, I cannot like, deny it, but it's not too much, but you have to be aware of it. The second is that, that these tools, although they are great tools, CNCF tools, and I can say a lot of things of them, but they are not very broadly adopted. So there can be like some usability issues and so on. So if you are going down this road, you have to be a little bit patient. Uh, also things like a few of them are, are managed through, through CRDs, which are kind of, uh, we've talked about it uh, with Kellen here, that, that like in an imperative, a uh, process like a CICD process is sometimes really hard to, uh, uh, to follow what's happening inside the CRs. And, uh, and obviously when you are missing some of the test paths in your CI CD uh, tests, then, then actually resulting policy objects might break your application at the end because if the real application is using different paths, then, then you will be, you'll have, might get to broken policies. 
and or broken applications. And uh, also, if your system is incomplete when you are capturing this information, obviously, again, your policies will be broken. Think about the very smallest thing. We didn't have uh, in our dev environment, we didn't have our Prometheus up and no one was calling into exporter APIs. Therefore, when we promoted into the production, when we, uh, when we started to use the exporter API, the export uh, API wasn't answering because the network policy logged it out. So you have to take in the, these things to account and go more, do these cap uh, information captures more in the direction of CD than CI. But what's good? So what is the positive things? So the positive things are actually you are improving your security posture by like far, like adding network uh, uh, network micro segmentation, adding seccomp uh, uh, profiles, uh, limiting the number of vulnerabilities you are ha you have to follow and update is like something that really like by order of magnitude raises your security game, and and you know like. I know that it's cheating to say that set up once and, let, uh, uh, and for, uh, forget it. It's not always true and you always have to have some maintenance, but in general, it is like any other CI-CD process we have. Uh, and you have to sometimes maintain it, but you're earning a lot of uh, value from it. And you're really getting into the things that are what you call least privilege uh, principles applied for sure, because you are only enabling things which are in use. So I've created this uh, 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 demo repo. You can scan the QR code. I will let you like give you a minute. You can jump here. Uh, uh, actually, I have to tell you, it, it was working on my machine. So, so uh, uh, but, uh, but if there is a problem, I think I, I would really like to maintain this like in a way that to promote the idea. So uh, if you are getting into problems, just open issues, and I don't know, we'll like sort it out. And I, 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 uh, I would be really happy to to like make of use it as an educational, uh, um, educational repo for for people who are want to implement advanced network policies and, and second policies inside their clusters. Um, also about the Cubescape, which is I've added to this presentation, but it's not released. It's going to be released next week. So if you are interested in the vulnerability uh, part, uh, you have to wait till next next week, and you will be able to to use it as well. So that's about it. Uh, rate my talk. Um, send me messages on on CNCF Slack or on, on Twitter, on, I don't know, uh, Pigeon uh, or something, uh, 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 you're more than welcome. And if anyone has any questions, I'm open here for questions because I see that I was able to, to make it, which is great.